Okay, today's lecture, we're going to look at wings, which are just 3D airfoils. Now, we've already talked a little bit indirectly uh, when we're talking about overall preliminary aircraft design about some of the considerations you need to take into account when thinking about 3D wings. But this is going back to the fundamentals of where that comes from. And this comes from Anderson's book, In chapter 5, sections 5.1 to 5.3.1. So earlier when we discussed aerodynamics, uh, we were only talking about 2D airfoil sections or equivalently infinite wings. However, since real aircraft have finite length wings, we want to qualify and quantify what happens to the lift and drag coefficients of a wing compared to the aerodynamics of the airflows which make up that wing. Another way of putting that is basically asking the question, is the total lift of a wing just the lift per unit span of its airfoil times the wingspan? The short answer to that question is no. The total lift is always less. The lift is always less than the per unit span times the span. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this in this course, just this one lecture. So this is going to be a high-level overview. And there's a few questions we're going to want to answer. The first is, why is L not equal to L prime B? The second is, what else changes for a finite wing? Aside from the lift. And then quantitatively, what is L? What is L? And L equals a function of what? So let's look at these one at a time. So to start, why does L not equal L prime B. Essentially the answer here is that the flow over an airflow is 2D while the flow over a wing is three-dimensional. If I sketch this out, it's easy to see what I mean. So here's the top view of a wing and here's the front view. Here's the center line of our aircraft. So here's the cord, C, and the wing area is S. V infinity is coming at the wing like this. And if we were to sketch a streamline moving over the top surface, it would do something like that. And a streamline going under the bottom surface would do the opposite, like that. And the reason for this is that at the wingtips, there's nothing to prevent the flow doing what it naturally wants to do, which is flowing from high pressure to low pressure. And so there's a net flow around the wingtips in that direction. This pushes the flow on the top towards the center, as shown here, and the flow on the bottom towards the outside, as shown here. So remember that the mechanism for generating lift is having a lower pressure on top of the wing than on the bottom. So this flow is going to curl around the wingtips because of that pressure difference. And that generates vorticity, which then moves downstream. And so there's a trailing vortex created at each wingtip. Um, 
Yes. Uh, and the impact of these vortices can be very significant. So, try to sketch this out. Here's our wing, maybe there's the airplane. So there are trailing vortices on each, the end of each wing tip. And for large airplanes, these can cause a small aircraft following in its wake too closely to go out of control because of these large variations in uh, velocity uh, due to these vortices. So the strength of these wingtip vortices is actually what sets the spacings required between takeoffs and landings at airports. Now the presence of these vortices induce a small downward component of air velocity around the wing, which we call downwash. And we give that the symbol W. So the downwash combines with the free stream V infinity to produce a local relative wind, basically a change in the local angle of attack. So I'm going to get a new page to sketch this out. And there's our horizontal line. Here's, say, our airfoil. And there's maybe our cord line. Then if this is the infinity, which is parallel to this dashed line here. The actual angle of attack of the airfoil is alpha. But because of the downwash W, the actual relative wind is this vector. So this causes what we call an induced angle of attack, alpha sub i, as a result of the downwash. There's a change in angle of attack. From geometry, this is alpha i, and the remaining angle of attack is the effective angle of attack, alpha effective. Now, if we draw a perpendicular line to this effective angle of attack, and where that crosses through the airfoil, this is then the lift vector because it's always perpendicular to the local angle of attack. This can be broken into vertical and horizontal components, and the horizontal component faces in the opposite direction, or in the direction of the relative wind, which means it's effectively a drag, and we call this the induced drag d sub i. And just to quantify the relationship between these various angles of attack, the effective angle of attack is the actual or geometric angle of attack minus this induced angle of attack. So now, as you can see from this figure, the effect of the uh, induced angle of attack uh, is to reduce the angle of attack, and in general, therefore, to reduce the lift. And it also tilts the lift backwards, which means the total lift is decreased. And in addition, this induced drag di is created. So that, uh, first of all, answers our first question of why L is not equal to L prime. B is because of this effect of the downwash in reducing the local angle of attack that each airfoil section sees. 
The second question was what else changes? And that's already been shown here as well. We now have drag in an inviscid flow. So we have no skin friction or separation effects, but we still have drag for a finite wing. So now we've answered our two qualitative questions. Um, next, we'll address the quantitative ones. So what is the lift for this finite wing and what is the induced drag?